The first thing I want to do is, is thank uh, the Fulbright program uh, profusely. Uh, this, this is, uh, I've been a, a Fulbright uh, uh, senior specialist before, uh, and uh, this, the opportunity to come to Australia, to Flinders, uh, it has been just uh, truly special. I've uh, been here uh, a couple of months. I can barely believe that. I have three more to go. I eked out five months, not, not four. Uh, and uh, it's been refreshing in any number of, of ways. The hospitality at Flinders, Don DeBott, uh, his staff, uh, and the Fulbright people, uh, Kendrine Holt uh, and her staff, have been just tremendous. And so I felt incredibly welcome, not just by the people involved here, but, but essentially by all uh, the folks I met in Australia. The first, we, we got into Brisbane after flying 14 hours, and uh, we had no Australian money. And so the, uh, we got to the bus to go from the uh, international terminal to the domestic terminal. And there was a sign there saying $5 to, per, per person on the bus. Uh, and I said, well, we don't, and I, I, I said, well, I have to go get some money. And a guy heard us. He just walked, reached into his wallet, picked out two fives, and said, here. Now, it turned out we didn't need the money. We gave it back to him. But that was our introduction to Australia. And it's been very similar. And if you have anything, you know, alternate stories, don't tell me. <laughs> um, OK. Uh, I'm a, a distinguished chair in uh, American politics. I want to talk about American politics uh, t tonight, although I have become increasingly fascinated with Australian politics uh, since, I, since, I, since I've, uh, I've been here. Uh, but I better not get started in that direction. Um, so you've got Obama. He's won an election. Uh, pretty good place to be, really, uh, for the first couple of years after you've won that second election. Uh, the first one might have been a fluke. The second one isn't. Uh, you can't run for re-election. Uh, you can set out your policy agenda, which Obama really did in his uh, State of the Union address uh, uh, a couple months ago. Um, Republicans say, well, wait a minute. We won the House of Representatives. We've got some say here, too. Pretty much American politics. Before that, though, I want to, I want to talk just for a second about looking at American politics from 10,000 miles away, particularly as an American. Over the last 20 years, I've talked a lot to the State Department uh, in, a, in a variety of, of settings. And um, it's been a tremendous experience. It's been a wonderful experience, uh, all leading up to coming here for, for, five, for five months. Um, and one of the things that I've uh, found uh, as I uh, look at, Amer at American politics from, from afar, um, uh, is that, that it generally looks better from 10,000 miles <laughs> away. Uh, if you're in Bangladesh or, or Nepal, where I was several years ago, uh, uh, Nepal could not put together a constitution. Uh, if you're in Indonesia, as I was uh, a year ago, May, um, they, they're struggling. Uh, to develop uh, democratic principles and, and then actions in, in, in many ways. Uh, when I was in Indonesia, they, they, almost every question was about money in politics, black money, uh, how it affects uh, their politics. And I could, you know, go, could go back and say, look, we've been we're doing this for 225 years, and we haven't got it right. You know, Time is, 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 a, is a good thing here. To, uh, and, and so the problems that look so big close up, they're still big. They're still huge in the United States. Uh, 10,000 miles away, they look a little smaller, if not more manageable, perhaps not quite as epic as we might look at day to day uh, uh, in, 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 the, in the US. Um, and indeed, uh, when we look at stalemate or gridlock or whatever we want to call it in the United States, the difficulty of getting things done, it begins to look a lot more like a condition rather than a problem. 
It is something that is part of the system. And, and I'll talk a little more about that. Um, we do have a problem getting things done in the United States. We have three powerful branches, we have powerful states. Um, and so the, the question, one of the questions is at least, um, is this really a problem? Uh, and, and honestly, from time to time, it, it, it is. It's, it's a huge, if you're about to default, the richest nation in the world is about to default on its debt. That's a problem. That's obviously a, a difficulty. Um, but at the same time, government structures, our sense of American exceptionalism, whatever you want to, however you want to look at the United States, in many ways, um, it may be much more of a condition, something not really attuned to solutions. If you define something as a problem, that implies immediately, of course, that there is a solution uh, to that, to that, that problem. Uh, and that's what politicians do a lot of the time. And look at something, here's a problem. Uh, teen pregnancies, uh, out of control or whatever. Too many abortions or uh, too many guns, too few guns. And I live in a state where they're just passing legislation that's going to allow potentially allow people, uh, students, uh, to have concealed carry in classrooms. I'm glad I'm retiring fairly soon. <laughs> I think there's a four-year window. I'm out of there. <laughs> I mean, the idea, you know, you know, in the United States we talk about, there's, there's a joke about disgruntled postal workers who end up shooting people. Uh, I don't know why postal workers more than others, but I mean, disgruntled students, clearly. I mean, Think more about your grading policy in those circumstances. <laughs> uh, now, sometimes real con conditions can become problems. They're fine as problems. Uh, whole equal rights across the board, I think, in the United States. Uh, 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 sometimes conditions, say, in the early part of the 20th century, as time went on, became defined as problems and have been addressed. Sometimes remarkably quickly, uh, the progression of public opinion on, on, on gay rights has just been amazing in the United States. We'll see what happens. It's a case before the Supreme Court. States are ratifying gay marriage or not, whatever. But uh, the public's views on gay marriage have changed uh, dramatically, uh, turning it into the notion of, of, uh, of the idea of civil unions or marriage or whatever, or the relations uh, uh, among same-sex people as uh, some kind of condition that, had to, that, that was there into a problem that could be addressed. Uh, really amazing. Uh, polio was a condition that became a problem. We have lots of instances like that. On the other hand, sometimes we define, uh, we, we talk about things as problems that may well be, at least for the medium term, better thought of as conditions. Global warming. Uh, as much as we like to think of it as a problem that can be solved in X, Y, or Z years, it may be, in the med medium, medium term at least, a condition that has to be uh, lived with in one way or another. It's not very optimistic. Uh, inequality of wealth, an another. Uh, the point is that, uh, uh, if we're in the United States, we're often looking at things, perhaps, as problems to be solved 10,000 miles away. They may look a lot more like conditions. Um, add to that uh, the idea that we govern in the United States increasingly by crisis. And uh, I had a, a, a long quote here, which I to, took out. Uh, it was a Canadian journalist. And he kind of listed the upcoming crisis for the spring of 2013. Uh, and uh, true enough, we're, we're working our way through them. And in, in fact, what's happening in the United States is that we're becoming very accustomed uh, to dealing with crises and then patching together a solution, moving on to the, to the, to the next one. 
uh, patching a, a, another solution together. Um, uh, so a lot of this has to do with, with funding the government. Uh, uh, and at the same time, uh, uh, a lesser known regular crisis is the uh, confirmation of, of presidential appointees, which has really become scandalous in the United States. Uh, presidents have, Republican and Democratic, have great trouble getting their nominees, uh, particularly for higher level judgeships, uh, confirmed, uh, not just for cabinet officers, uh, the Department of Consumer Affairs, uh, Financial Affairs was created, uh, and uh, has, the head has not been confirmed. And it's almost a matter of principle that Republicans uh, in the Senate and the House want to change the nature of that mandate of that official uh, before they'll confirm someone as the head of the, uh, of the office. It was passed into law. Uh, and yet they won't confirm uh, the head. So there is this regular kind of obstruction. So uh, if stalemate, roughly speaking, is a kind of condition, uh, then who are the suspects? Well, the first suspects, of course, are the framers. Uh, and we, we, we deify the framers. Um, they may be demigods, not complete gods, but they're pretty smart folks uh, who did a tremendous job. Uh, but um, they created a system that was highly complex, separation of powers, federalism, etc. Political parties, second set of suspects, uh, have evolved into uh, entities that create real problems for getting uh, things, things done. And finally, organized interests. Uh, again, uh, an evolution over time. Um, so let me look at these, uh, these three elements uh, briefly. Uh, the framers were really successful. Uh, it's pretty much straightforward. They wanted a strong national government, uh, and they got one. Uh, no, question about, no question about it. Uh, at the same time, uh, they understood their strong national government simply couldn't be a strong executive. Uh, and in fact, short term, they were far more worried about the Congress uh, than they were about, about the executive. And they barely considered the judiciary. Uh, eh, okay, an independent judiciary. Not even sure what it meant. It had to evolve over, 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 over time. So 225 years later, fast forward, uh, certainly the presidency has gotten much, much stronger, without any question, the executive branch. But still, the Congress is very much, very strong and independent, and the judiciary is very strong. Uh, and, and so you do have this uh, uh, multiple centers of power in existence that is a condition of American politics. Uh, in the Constitution, you couldn't get rid of the Senate even if you wanted to, and a variety of people would love to. Uh, but uh, it, it's, it, it's an impossibility. Um, so, uh, in the end, you have a system by design that's fragmented. Uh, without, and, and so the framers created a powerful center, to be sure. And Hamilton saw this coming uh, from the, the 1790s. Um, but at the same time, uh, if you went to Obama or Nixon or Johnson or Reagan or George Bush or Clinton and, said, and talked about him of how, about how strong the executive is, uh, they, would look at, they would look at you as if you were a little crazy. Because from the presidential point of view, uh, they don't feel that all that's all that all powerful, even as they take on more power from administration to administration. Um, so we've got this fragmented system. You need something to pull it together. Well, the answer, of course, was political parties. Uh, and in this instance, uh, in the United States, uh, unlike Australia, uh, we basically stick to one kind of election that for national office, and that's first past the post. Uh, you get the most votes in a single member district, whether it's a state, congressional district, or in our electoral college in a state, uh, you win all the votes. 
you win, you win, you, you win the office. Uh, so uh, that's just the way we do it. We don't do PR. We don't, we don't do uh, uh, a variety of other uh, uh, forms of, of electoral process, single transferable vote, what, what have you. We simply do first past the post. That organizes the electorate into, into two distinct parties. Occasionally, we've had third parties, but basically, Republicans and Democrats have dominated, uh, continue to dominate, uh, and there's no change on, her, on, on the horizon. So that's important. Uh, increasingly important, I think, is how we select our candidates. Uh, we select our candidates through primary elections. There's no bunch of king makers. There's no slate makers. Uh, as there were 100 years ago, 120 years ago, with bosses in American politics. Rather, uh, we select our candidates uh, in, in primary elections. Now, if we, the way we do this is to have generally, although there's, now there is some fooling around with this format, generally Republicans select their candidates, Democrats select their candidates, and Particularly what's happened in, in recent years is the most extreme, most energized members of the political parties, and particularly Republicans, have become dominant in the primary election uh, process. So we get this over-representation increasingly of people on the, on the right in the, in the Republican Party. Democrats have pretty much stayed, we'll talk a little bit more about this, have pretty much stayed in kind of a moderate liberal uh, mode. There are very, very few far left people in American politics and even fewer people who get elected to office. Uh, a lot of this happens on the right wing of the Republican Party with very conservative people dominating the nominating process. Finally, this is the duopoly part of this, uh, Republicans and Democrats often disagree violently on all kinds of stuff. Highly ideological politics over the last 20 or 30 years. But they do agree that election laws should favor the two major parties. <laughs> what a stunner, you know. So, you know, they really do disagree on uh, tremendously, but on electoral law, they make it very difficult for third parties to enter the arena. So the stalemate story from a political party point of view, very briefly, is that, that American politics looking back to the 50s and 60s, which weren't very ideological, have over the last 30 years become far more ideological. If you want a break point, 1980 is a pretty good one, the election of Ronald Reagan. Uh, but a whole variety of trends. Uh, Lyndon Johnson passed major civil rights legislation in 64 and 65 and said, we're going to lose the South for a generation. Well, Lyndon Johnson's a very smart guy very smart politician. He was pretty much right. They lost, it for, they lost the South for a generation, uh, but they've lost it for far longer. The South is, is very, very Republican and very, and very uh, uh, conservative. Uh, and so we used to have all these wonderful old Southern Democratic figures, very romantic, the old white guys who were sort of liberal on some issues, but conservative on civil rights and, and flexible in their principles sometimes. Uh, and they could negotiate. Those folks are gone. Rather, with Ronald Reagan and then Newt Gingrich in the 80s and 90s, you begin to have far greater ideological politics. Uh, and, and a lot of it is Republicans moving farther to their right. Again, Democrats kind of have stayed in the kind of moderate liberal position. Bill Clinton certainly didn't take the party farther to the right, quite the reverse. But uh, N Gingrich and Reagan and, and, and many others uh, solidified this conservative hold on the, on the Republican Party. And then, and this is very significant, I think, over the last two presidencies, George W. Bush and then uh, Barack Obama, you have an intensification of partisanship. As I just looked at an article today in the American Political Science Review about how elite partisanship has spread to mass partisanship. Uh, and I think that part of it was with Bush, 
with Democrats because seeing him as, as part of them saw him as illegitimate out of the 2000 election uh, and further illegitimate in, the, in light of the, uh, the war on Iraq. Uh, and it's, I think it's pretty common knowledge that Barack Obama has uh, fostered intense hostility on, on the right in American politics. And that really hasn't, hasn't let up. You have a, a substantial number of people uh, on the right who simply do not see Barack Obama as, as legitimate. So if you have these kinds of intense dislikes to the points of hatred or distrust, this partisanship, it's not just polarization, uh, but the partisanship and the polariz ideological polarization overlap. We haven't seen that for over 100 years in American politics. Uh, so the, the partisan, that's the partisan uh, story uh, in many ways. And very briefly, I'll just go run you through the Senate. Uh, this is the last two Senates. The 112th ended in 2012. The 113th is just starting. Democrats and Republicans almost completely separate. Now, if we were in, in, in Australia, we wouldn't, these are based on votes. We wouldn't have any, there wouldn't be no, no uh, curves at all. It'd just be a straight line labor, straight line coalition with a few outliers. Uh, uh, but in the United States, this is very significant in terms of the level of partisanship. Uh, the Senate has grown more, and the same thing for the House grown more polarized. Republicans, the blue line on top has become more, more conservative. Democrats have become more and more, uh, uh, to an extent, more liberal. Uh, but it's really the Republican line that keeps going up. Uh, and that distance between them has, has, has grown. Uh, this has consequences in the US Senate. Uh, lots more filibusters, lots more delaying tactics. Uh, and even though it's simply a rule of the U.S. Senate, not in this Constitution, just a rule of the U.S. Senate, it's a rule that's highly enshrined. And so even as the Senate often grinds to a halt um, and deals are made, delay occurs on an on increasing, on increasing basis. Uh, and these aren't the old time filibusters of people on cots. Uh, you know, staying, sitting there for days on end. These are filibusters uh, run by the leaders in the Senate, and if you don't have 60 votes, you won't get something passed, 60 out of 100. So if you're in a minority and you have more than 40 votes, you're in pretty good shape. So the partisan version is basically this, ideological parties within a separation of power system. Um, 60 votes needed in the Senate to get things done. And in the House, political scientists have resisted this over the years, but I think pretty much now they agree that over the last 20 to 30 years, the gerrymandering in, in uh, congressional districts really does make a difference in who wins uh, the U.S. House. And so Democrats got more votes this time for the U.S. House, but Republicans because they controlled state legislatures in the most recent redistricting process in 2011 and 12, have the, the, the majority in the, in the US House. Um, and finally, there's just no middle in the Congress. There are fewer and fewer and fewer moderates, and particularly on the Republican side. Uh, it, there's simply this great ideological divide tilted a bit to the right. Now. There's another story here on stalemate, and that's the, st the story of, of, of interest groups. Um, interest groups have been with us forever. Uh, you can go back uh, to the uh, colonial times. Uh, American interest groups lobbied the London Board of Trade. Uh, they lobbied in the 1790s. Land speculators, can you imagine that, lobbying? It sort of sounds like South Australia politics or New South Wales politics or, or politics. Uh, so uh, there's always been a lot. But with the growth of government, uh, you have a growth of interest groups. And I think the, the general model is that, OK, we, interest groups want something, so they go to the government. 
uh, and, and seek this stuff out. Uh, but in many ways, and certainly this is true over the last 50 years, the model may well have been the other reverse. Government grows, uh, and because government grows, it uh, attracts, helps create more interest groups, sometimes the interest groups created by the government themselves. This is true in almost all uh, de democracies. Uh, and so you get groups wanting more policies, more policies producing more groups. Uh, to the point that, and it's very hard to get a, a figure on this, uh, you get 12,000 to 14,000 registered lobbyists in DC. Uh, my friend Jim Thurber from American University on a kind of back of the envelope now 15 years ago said there are probably 100,000 people that make their living on lobbying in DC. Uh, and I, and if we've worked this out in a couple of different ways. And it's probably true. It's very difficult to pin it down. But if you've got that many people representing big interests, small interests, all kinds of interests, uh, you have so many lobbyists and groups protecting all these policies that have come into place that you end up with a, st a very, very, very powerful status quo. It's a 10-year major project uh, in American politics run by Frank Baumgartner and a group at Penn State. Uh, and one of the things they discovered, among many others, in this very large project is the status quo is really, really powerful. And that, and that results in what John Roche, uh, a very smart guy in, in Washington, a journalist, calls demosclerosis. Very difficult to make things move, get things, get things done. Um, so, very briefly, you focus on short-term issues, lots of lobbyists, not much accountability. Republicans blame Democrats, Democrats blame Republicans. Uh, everyone throws their hands up and says, oh, the interests are all powerful. If you want to really see how this works, look at health care in the United States before, during, and after the Obamacare uh, measures are passed. Uh, uh, lots of lobbying before and, and, and during, but still a tremendous amount of lobbying on how regulations are uh, enacted, which ones, uh, how they are interpreted, et, et, et cetera. So what we get out of this is crisis after crisis after crisis. Uh, and we get this regularized. We can schedule our, our crises. Uh, and what the... The, the tools that legislative le leaders, like the Senate leaders have, is to say, OK, uh, we're having a crisis. The current one is funding uh, the, uh, the debt. Uh, and it looks like they've got a deal. Almost certainly they have a deal. But they're going to play things out, work over the weekend. Everyone's going to be unhappy. And finally, they'll come to a deal. They'll be exhausted. Uh, they will, they'll be unhappy with the process, as well they should be. Uh, but we'll buy them six more months or four more months or whatever, and we'll go back and, and do the same thing uh, in that six months or four months. Uh, so you've got this fragmented system. Um, now sometimes we actually have change. And really the way you get change in the American system is through a crisis. About 10 years ago I was in D.C. and I, I was talking to a bunch of senior staffers. There are probably about 25 of them. They were really wonderful people, uh, senior staffers in Congress. They'd been around 10, 15, 20 years. And I edited a book on civility in the Senate. Uh, yeah. Uh, and so we'd, I was talking to them with, with another, another person uh, about civility. And it was, you know, we, it, we had a nice talk. And then at the end I said, you know, OK. You guys have been here for a long time. You're smart. How do we deal with I, the example I gave was Social Security? Could have been Medicare. Could have been a variety of things. How do we deal with this? And uh, uh, Republican, Democrat, man, woman, committee staffer, personal staff, as a person, they said, oh, no problem. There'll be a crisis, and then we'll fix it. <laughs> I said, OK. Uh, I, we're in a pretty bad problem right now. And this now is 10 years later. And, and, and now, Social Security can be fixed. We could, we could all, we could have an exercise today on our Social Security system. We give you the figures, and everyone have the back of an envelope. And 
in half an hour or 15 minutes, everyone could figure out how to fix Social Security. Honestly, the, the math of it. Medicare, impossible in the United States. You can't, you, you, there's too many moving parts, you can't fix it. That, that's a, the real crisis, long-term crisis. But, but Social Security you could fix. Now, we haven't fixed it, uh, but, but, but you could. But they were confident, these staffers, that you have a crisis and, and then you fix it. What we've seen, though, over the last 10, 15 years in this high partisan era, they were working too much from memory and how things got done in the past. Uh, we get these very lowest common denominator deals, sequestration. You know, we'll, well, we'll cut a bunch of stuff in the future. Uh, a lot of it's symbolic. After 9-11, uh, we have to act. So what do we do? We, produ we produce the Department of Homeland Security, a pretty terrible department. Almost every public administration person disliked the idea. It's not a very uh, useful bureaucracy, uh, huge, but symbolically, Homeland Security, we did something. And our, we add layers of policy on t the tax code, things of that nature. Um, <clears throat> uh, we create these crises of a hostage taking. We're not going to we're not going to uh, approve ex nominee Chuck Hagel, whoever, until something something happened. And most importantly, is the decline first of compromise, but more importantly of deliberation. Uh, we really have a tr hard trouble talking to each other uh, within, the, particularly within the Congress, but between the White House and the Congress as well. An inability to deliberate in part because of polarization, uh, in part because it's difficult to move off the status quo. So, um, uh, by and large, I'm not very optimistic about American politics. We've got to grind on. Um, and so, you know, should we be optimistic in, in, in any way? Well, there's a lot of bad news. The partisanship continues. Uh, and, and it's probably more partisan this year in terms of absolute numbers than it was even a year ago or two years ago or four years ago. Um, a lot of that happens, happens because the far right Tea Party sympathizers or whatever on the right side of the Republican Party uh, have no desire to countenance compromise in any way. So a guy like Richard Luger, six-term uh, senator, 36 years, Rhodes Scholar, uh, quite conservative, but certainly not crazy, highly respected on foreign policy, gets beat by someone in the farther right of his party. And you, several times that's happened in the United States. So those people are beaten, but it also affects almost every other elected official, again, within the Republican Party, who are scared to move very much to the middle, try to compromise, try to deliberate, because they know they may be penalized. Um, no willingness to countenance tax increases uh, by Republicans, particularly in the House. Um, just no, no willingness at, at all, uh, uh, no matter how much savings you get from spending. Uh, and the ability to filibuster. Uh, and finally, I, I, I can't underestimate this on the right side of, the, of American politics. Uh, by about a quarter of the American people, uh, Obama is just more than disliked. He really is hated. Uh, for one reason, uh, quite irrational in many ways, but it's there. Uh, and, and so this intensifies the, the divisions in, in, a, in a lot. It doesn't mean they can't be overcome, but it intensifies them. Uh, this is one of my congressmen from Kansas, Tim Hulskamp. He was crazy when he was a state senator in Kansas. Uh, he remains pretty much crazy in the U.S. House. Uh, and this is a picture, of actual picture of him on the floor with his iPad, counting votes, trying to get enough votes so that John Boehner will not be elected speaker, even though John Boehner had the support of overwhelming a number of his, of his Republican colleagues in, in, in the House. Uh, again, a fairly small group uh, wanting to do in uh, their leaders. I, I know that sounds very foreign to you in, 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 in Australia. Just, just an aside. Uh, I'm sorry, I'm, I 
personally identify as a Democrat, but I don't think I'm particularly uh, a crazed one uh, or ideological. Uh, if you look at the budgets that have been proposed recently, the Democrats basically have a balanced approach. We could argue about it, some tax increases, some spending cuts. Uh, Paul Ryan, the vice presidential candidate, wants over 10 years uh, 4.6 trillion in, in cuts, no tax increases, uh, and reduced tax rates for, for, for the wealthy. Now that's not going to happen, uh, but it's a, a, almost an extreme ideological point to, to even start things. Uh, and, and it has political support within the House, uh, but not within the country, and certainly it's not going to work with, 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 with Obama. So again, the, the tilt to the right. Uh, but there's some glimmers of hope. Uh, the framers got a lot of things right. Parties have survived admirably in American politics. For the Democrats are now 130, 180 years, the Republicans are 160 years in existence, have, have survived very well. Uh, interest groups have survived and, 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 and uh, prospered in many ways. Uh, so, uh, well, we have elections, and elections aren't mandates. And I, I know there's a whole uh, kind of, uh, there's a whole field of study about mandates in, in, in elections in parliamentary systems. Uh, but elections, if they're not mandates, they still mean something. Obama's second election. So, you have uh, Obama's final election, he wins a second term, and all the demographic trends look very good for Democrats. Those are real. Um, Republicans don't like to lose. If you're a two-party system, you either win or you lose. Uh, and Republicans definitely don't like losing. So you're seeing this debate in the Republican Party. Huge document a couple days ago about what went wrong. 100 pages. That was the, that was the executive summary. Uh, <laughs> no, but, but, but seriously. Uh, a lot of people that we would have thought 10 years ago, 15 years ago, very, very conservative are now in the middle in this. People who really want to get things done. Uh, and we're seeing this with very serious conservatives. A guy from Oklahoma named Tom Coburn. Six, seven years ago, everyone thought, oh my god, this guy is so far out, he's crazy. He hasn't really changed his ideology, but what he has demonstrated, he's willing to work with the Democrats. He's willing to talk, to engage, and maybe even deliberate. Uh, and so, rather than becoming a serious part of a problem, he really has, if there is a solution, he may be part of it. Now, he's not giving up his values, but he's actually being willing to, to talk, which right now is pretty unusual. Uh, the U.S. Senate, and we'll see in a second, can initiate legislation. It's not just a graveyard where, where filibusters occur. Money for uh, relief for the hurricane, avoiding the fiscal cliff in December, and uh, the Violence Against Women Act. Uh, so, some changes here. Uh, push to the wall, Republicans are saying, look, we may want some things to go, go through. Uh, immigration is a good candidate to follow, to follow suit. Uh, this was summarized very nicely by a friend of mine, Greg Coger, the other day. Uh, the red circle rep represents uh, proposals that majority of House members, and the House is the big problem here, would want. Most of these in this Venn diagram are something that won't help them electorally at all. Uh, uh, on the other hand, there's a blue circle. These are things that might help the Republicans. Uh, the Violence Against Women Act. Uh, I won't go into it, but uh, you can understand the symbolism. Uh, immigration reform. as, as uh, uh, big relief for the hurricane victims. These are things they may not support, but see that electorally they would be useful. So if you can get, begin to have that happen, even if they don't dis disagree as a party, enough members may join Democrats to get more things done. Um, so, uh, elections sometimes matter. Things change. Uh, Obama wins a second term, uh, and Republicans want to escape blame for the possibility that there'll be a fiscal disaster uh, and other things. 
this third point here is really important. Even dysfunctional institutions can produce policy solutions, but they're often really bad. Sequestration, just cutting across the board. Uh, no one, people, oh, we'll, we'll get our way out of this. No, we're not. And people are accepting it. And it might not be the worst thing, but it's not very good policy. And Republicans would like it if we're in a parliamentary system, but we're not. Uh, so we can't plan, deliberate very much. Um, there's this huge ideological divide. There's a tremendous emphasis on the status quo. And yet, American parties and interest groups can find ways within this system the framers put together to muddle through. It's not a very optimistic perspective there. But it's a little like the staffers that I talked to 10 years ago. Well, there'll be a crisis and we'll fix it. Um, maybe. Maybe. That's about the, the most optimistic that you can, you can say. But we're not very good at deliberation right now, and we're downright terrible at long-term planning. So could we do any better? Uh, a friend of mine, Jerry Seib from the Wall Street Journal, wrote this a couple of years ago. American as political leaders, after two decades of failing to come together, blah, 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 seem to have lost their faith in ability to do so. A political system that expects failure doesn't try very hard to produce anything else. And I, I read this a couple of days ago, and I thought a lot about it over the last uh, couple of days. And I think implicitly I've thought a lot about it over the last 10 or 15 years. I do think we try to do big things. Uh, we may not choose very well. I think we ch 10 years ago, we chose unbelievably badly with Iraq. Uh, we chose to do health care. The, the jury is, is still out. Lots of people in the United States, conservatives, moderates, liberals, want to do things on the budget. Um, whether we can do it or not is, an, is, another, is another matter. So in many ways, it strikes me, uh, that American politics is the system that the, fe the founders set up pretty much knowingly. They missed a few things, but pretty much knowingly. It's lasted for 225 years. Parties and interest groups have adapted to it. And it's what we're stuck with. Uh, and from 10,000 miles away, it looks a lot better than from being in the heart of the country. Thank you very much. Yeah. Hi, I'm Callum Young. I'm here with a bunch of uh, full blood scholars. Um, most of them probably uh, developed a, a sudden appetite for American politics, and that seems. And in fact, I went and saw um, Lincoln in that movie yes. a little while ago, and that, that prompted me to go down to, to read a bit more on the internet about Lincoln and so forth with Robert Kennedy. And one of the things that came up when I read that uh, was this commentary by someone, someone contemporary, looking back and saying, that, that, that the greatness is, is just not available to you know, leaders anymore. And I don't know whether that's actually a consequence of, it felt, it felt like a true statement, but I don't know whether it's just us modifying our rosy view of the past or whether it's actually got something to it. Do you have any views on that? I think it's harder to be great. I think it's harder to be great in institutions, gen particularly well-developed institutions, whether it's a corporation, or you know, think of uni if you go back, I, I don't know about Australia, but in the United States you go back and, and there are legendary university uh, presidents, chancellors of the past, and now they're essentially managers. Uh, it's, it's, I think it's much harder. Uh, I think it's harder to be uh, a, a, great, a, great, a great president uh, in, in, a, in a lot of ways. Uh, so it may, it may well be uh, the era moving, you know, 50 years from now, we may just say, oh, you know, gee, that so-and-so could, could do this in those circumstances moves him higher on, on, on the pantheon. But I, 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 you know, I think Bill Clinton, uh, 
who certainly aspired to greatness, uh, despite many flaws. Uh, but Bill, uh, I, I think that, and, and I'm getting into John Hart's territory and, and others, but I, I think he rued in some sense that he didn't have a great crisis that he could, he could res re respond to. Um, and, and so the problem is that the great crisis of our time may be global warming, say. And it's extraordinarily difficult to deal with you know, what, what one person is going to lead there, even though it may be the, the profound issue of our time. Now, maybe it's not. But, but so I guess, I guess I think it would be easier uh, in, 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 a somewhat, in a somewhat simpler, uh, a, a simpler time. But you can have profound influence. Certainly, Ronald Reagan had profound influence. Maggie Thatcher had profound influence. Uh, we'll see about Obama. Yes. Uh, there are some, some really interesting uh, studies uh, and at least correlation between increasing polarization and increasing inequality. Uh, I think that there is a, uh, an empirical element to it and a normative element to it. And coming to Australia has really been an eye opener to me. In, in many ways, uh, and I don't know again how you, what your sense of Australia is in terms of inequality, but I see so much less inequality here than in, in the United in the United States, in term, and in particularly in the, the 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 overwhelming accumulation of wealth by the top 001 uh, percent, uh, and, and so in in that in in that sense, I, I think. Inequality uh, certainly, if it doesn't drive polarization, uh, it, it, it contributes to it and, and, re and reinforces it. And that's a situation, again, where I think that in many instances, Americans, despite growing inequality, don't see it as, 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 as a problem. The moment that the 50% of the people in the middle really see this, if they do ever see it as a problem, I think it would then would be redefined as a problem. And there, and, but we didn't even talk about money in politics here. And, and money in politics is, is clearly very, very important. And we're experiencing a, uh, a new era in American politics where money is, there are essentially no effective campaign finance laws in the United States right now. Uh, it's a, a slightly exaggerated statement, but not much. Uh, and, and so the way money goes into, flows into politics right now, it, it really does reflect this great inequality. So I, I think it's a big issue. Yeah. Hi, uh, thank you for your talk. I'm a current year Fulbright fellow as well. I wanted to get your view on the media and whether you think it has contributed or at least to what degree it's contributed to the dumbing down of uh, the lowest common denominator result. Uh, yeah. Uh, before I forget it, uh, I just I just saw a. This is at least tangentially related to your question. Uh, I just saw a figure about news reporting and uh, and commentary opinion on cable TV. And it was about two to one commentary to reporting. Uh, so I think that that uh, contributes, that, 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 that's an element. Uh, in some ways, there's never been a better era in which to be informed about American politics. Uh, during the presidential election of 2008, I'd go to China or Taiwan or wherever, and there would be these incredibly well-informed uh, individuals who've never been in the United States but had good English and and did various websites and, and could ask very good questions. Uh, so in some sense, it's a great era to be informed. I think the more general point is that uh, people aren't very well informed. Uh, facts have less and less significance. That's pretty clear. It, that facts don't matter much uh, at, at all. I mean, Obama's birth certificate, long form birth certificate is an example, case in, case in point. Well, you could have done that and, you know, 
so, you know, so uh, page maker could have done that, blah, blah, blah. So uh, I think political scientists are pretty slow to blame the media uh, in, lots of, uh, in lots of ways. Uh, uh, and, and, and we never had a great, greatly informed population to, be, to, to, be, to begin with. Uh, a couple of guys who have focused, have, have paid a lot of attention to this. Uh, uh, Tom Mann at Brookings and Norm Ornstein at the American Enterprise Institute. Uh, one of their solutions, among others, uh, was, was to have some form of compulsory voting, uh, which you've had some experience with. Uh, so, I, I, I'm, 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 I think that there is a dumbing down, uh, but I'm, I'm, I also think that if you want to be informed, it, it's probably as good a time in, in searching out information as, as ever. Most people don't. And the other thing is most people search out information that confirms their beliefs. Yeah? I think I heard you identify yourself maybe as a Democrat. Yeah. Um, and then you said you thought that the Republicans have been dragged you know, further to the right. Well, dragged or, or have or scurried or over there. I don't know. Um, firstly, is that a widely held, like, is that just common knowledge? And secondly, is there any effort on the part of the Republicans to drag themselves back to the Yeah, I, that, that, I think in, I think that, uh, by and large, say among academics, and I would say, I would say even most news folks, there's a belated acknowledgement that that's been, been the case. And for a long time, it was, oh, things are getting more divided, and that's true. But really, a lot of it has been movement to the, to the, to the right. Within the Republican Party, uh, the farthest right people embraced that. Said, that's, this is where we ought to be. And we lost the election because we were, were not conservative enough. There's a little reality testing problem there uh, uh, on that. But I think the key people to, to watch are the people like Marco Rubio um, uh, and Ryan to an extent, people who want to be president and, and are uh, trying to redefine Republican politics more inclusively. And the easiest place for them to do it is with, with immigration because Hispanics are often quite conservative, they're religious, hard workers, believe in capitalism. Uh, and so in, in some ways a natural constituency for, 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 for Republicans in, 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 a lot of, in a lot of ways. I think they're moving on gay marriage and, and, and homosexuality to an extent. Uh, but there's a hardcore opposed to immigration reform, certainly hard to oppose to gay, gay marriage. Uh, and the Republicans themselves are going to battle this out. I would say it's not so much, it's part of it's moving back a little toward the center. Part of it's trying to redefine themselves in, 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 in some ways that's more, more welcoming. Uh, and I think they're actually, although I might disagree with them, their, their economic uh, issues are probably more powerful right now than their social issues, which has been quite the reverse in some time. You know. uh, and they're finding social issues as kind of a drag on them right now. So I think that's where I see the movement. Other questions? Yeah. Uh, you mentioned the system that's basically going from crisis to crisis. Why is there such a uh, lack of willingness to question the design of the founders? It's ah. so sacrosanct. Like, <laughs> uh, right, right, right. Oh, no, they didn't. They, uh, for one thing, they were pretty good at it, though. This is a con the Constitution survived for 225 years. But, but uh, much like the Australian Constitution, we've, it's proven very difficult to amend. Um, and uh, I think that uh, historically, when we've had a problem, we've, we've found a way uh, to overcome the separation of powers, to, to have a crucial judicial decision or a crucial presidential uh, initiative uh, or 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 uh, a major uh, piece of legislation. Uh, I think. I mean, I certainly think that uh, I would love to have a popularly elected president. 
not someone who went through the electoral college, which is, I think, a distorting thing. But say, say something like representation and proportional representation. It's just not on the table in the United States. It's, it's not seen as, a, as, a, as, as, a, as an issue. So uh, I think it's, it's very hard to, to get things done symbolically. Very, you know, the, 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 the framers are, are enshrined. Um, and even rules like the Senate, which could be changed potentially by 50, 50 51 senators, they find it very difficult uh, to do. But it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a good point. Uh, we are a system that is not very responsive. Uh, and that may get us in long term in, into, into trouble. Yeah? You don't have to notice quite a contrast in our culture, the secular nature. Could you tease that and just comment on the effect of religiosity in the United States? Yeah. Uh, I'm not an expert in religion, religion and, and, and politics, but, but certainly um, it is far more part of our public life in, 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 many, in many ways. When I came here, uh, uh, and I, 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 it was a while before, and someone had to explain it to me, that, uh, that uh, Tony Abbott was quite a conservative Catholic and that Julia Gillard was uh, an atheist. Uh, but it, and, and once you can see it, the tinges of that, and maybe you can see it more, but by and large, it doesn't enter the public sphere. Uh, certainly, that's not the case in, in the United States. You have strong religious uh, interest groups uh, that, that have probably have been more powerful in the past than they are right, than they are right now. Um, but, uh, We've elected uh, an African American president. We certainly would have elected Hillary Clinton. We still may elect Hillary Clinton. Uh, the idea of electing someone who was an announced atheist uh, uh, would, is, is quite unthinkable, I, I, I think. So a religion does come into the public sphere. And again, more from the right than, 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 than from, from, the, from, the, from the left. Yes? Uh, since the uh, 9th of everyone, do you think the uh, consensus on the foreign policy um, war on war on terror in places like Afghanistan and, and Iraq was not war on terror? So how do you see that like in the, the, the two parties uh, when it comes to Afghanistan or like war on terror? And okay, the, qu the, question, the question is kind of the post 9-11 evolution of policy on, on Iraq and Af 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 Afghanistan. Uh, I mean, I think that's been fascinating. Uh, I think we, as I said, I think we made a huge mistake in, 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 in Iraq. Uh, I don't want to go into the whole policy making process. Uh, the extension of executive power in this realm has been overwhelming with Bush. And Ob I think many people thought Obama would pull back. He really hasn't much at, at, at all. Uh, and yet, the American people, by and large, think Iraq was a mistake. You can get somewhat different polling results. Uh, but Democrats are overwhelming. Independents are pretty substantial. Republicans still favor it. Uh, but the partisan lens is very strong there. Um, and and, and it, it, it strikes me that, that there's this notion of, we've, one of the lessons we learned from Vietnam, I think very hard, was uh, that we probably didn't support the troops, that they came back and, and, and were often very alienated. So I think we have, the American people have supported the troops a lot more uh, than they have. We still haven't had our serious re-examination of uh, Iraq and Af Afghanistan. Uh, when that will occur, I, I, I don't know. Uh, I, I, we're in the process of it. But we've been, these wars have been fought by voluntary ar armies. And so the wars have, for all their losses, their costs, they haven't affected average Americans as much as you might think. Now, I think this is a really bad thing. I think 
we should try to understand that lots more. The Vietnam War, many more people went. There was a draft, so you, you knew people. Everyone knew people who went and died. Uh, and, and so I, I think that it has been set apart probably more than you would think looking at it from, 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 from afar. Uh, and, I, and I think that's a problem in a democracy that you, you shouldn't be able to go to war so easily, have the costs that are so great um, oh, add up. Uh, and then 10th anniversary, we're having a lot of debate over that in the United States right now, lots of editorials and stuff, but we still haven't come to terms with it. Uh, I, don't, I don't think. I think the costs, the long-term costs are huge for the, for the United States, and we, and we haven't had that, that, that debate. It may be a debate for historians rather than for, for politicians. Yeah. Yeah. I think that uh, it, it's it's always tempting to to say ah the me the media uh, they, in one way or another are are responsible but I do think the twenty four seven nature of the media uh, and you see this in Australia as well you know you you, you can't you know you know get, get your foot wet without uh, a bunch of reporters coming down and, and things are reported and well uh, what you know, a leak here or or, or there. Uh, there's a, there are, so a couple of things. One is the 24-7 nature. One is lots more opinion than reporting. Uh, and uh, it is the, the self-reinforcing nature that uh, liberals read the liberal stuff, conservatives read conservative stuff. Um, uh, and there, there, there isn't much uh, exchange, learning, what have you. And that's just simply gotten worse as parties, parties and partisanship have gotten stronger, those partisan lenses become stronger. And, and so we see things increasingly through those, 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 those lenses. And I think that's one, been one of the, the effects of party elites, political elites, and the media together changing the nature of, 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 the, of the debate, the discourse, into one that's hard to have uh, an engaged argument. Just like it's hard to have an engaged argument in the Congress, it's hard to have it in, uh, uh, in, the, in the population, and, and the media are certainly part of that. Thank you. Thanks very much. Thank you.